So people are still coming in into our uh, virtual OECD Berlin Center room. So I'll wait a little bit longer, but not too much <laughs> so that everybody can take a seat and feel comfortable, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, it's getting long. Yes, welcome everybody in our virtual OECD uh, event on, um, on dual education, a work, a work place based vocational education in, in Central and Eastern um, Europe. My name is Nicola Brandt and I head the OECD Berlin Center. So it's a sort of a satellite uh, at, in Berlin. Of course, uh, most of you know that the OECD is uh, based in Paris. Um, the reason why we're doing this as a Berlin center is that of course we like to, uh, well, discuss uh, OECD analysis of relevance for, for the central European region with not only the German speaking countries that we cover, but also the partners with whom uh, they have um, strong relations as investors. And uh, I think the uh, vocational education system is really one of the um, um, main points where you can really talk about how uh, foreign investment can be used to mutual benefit, to learn from each other. Uh, many of you may know that in not only in Germany, but also in Austria and Switzerland, countries that we cover, that dual education where companies and schools work closely together has a long tradition. Um, well, in some ways in Eastern European, Central and Eastern European neighboring countries, that was the case also before the fall of the wall. In communist times, schools working closely with big conglomerates companies, but then in the transition to a market economy, many of these companies disappeared, new, mostly often micro enterprises appeared on the market and reestablishing these strong ties between schools and enterprises just took time. But in the past few years, there has been a lot of progress and uh, in many countries. Um, uh, and, and that's something we want to look at. And we also want to look at how these countries, schools, enterprises in the region um, can learn from um, uh, examples that are brought in by German, Austrian, Swiss investors, but also how they can learn from these countries and, of course, how uh, different countries in the region can learn from each other. And uh, for these purposes, we have a really great panel, I think, today. So we will be um, uh, my, my, my colleague Marike van der Weyer from the Vocation Education, the Skills Center, uh, will introduce us into the subject. And then we have players uh, from the region, from all walks of life, if you will, that are important for the subject. So we have Marcin Budzewski uh, from the Institute for Labor Market Analysis in Poland, who specializes in evaluating um, various government programs, but chief among them labor market programs, vocational education. We have Andrei Huta, who is uh, the head um, of the Board of Employers for Vocational Education in Slovakia that has been introduced a couple of years ago when Slovakia rolled out dual education um, across the board in some ways. In principle, we have uh, Marian Lovas, uh, but I don't know whether he has he appeared. Uh, I'm not sure. He was not with us a moment ago but he might come from Brose, who's a German car maker in, in central Slovakia and who's been, uh, so he's a trainer in the company and can give us that um, insight. And then we have Tomasz Matkiewicz, who runs a very advanced, technologically advanced uh, school, vocational education school uh, close to Poznan in Plesnia. And so we have that, um, that perspective as well. And then of course we have you, from the audience, many companies, uh, um, uh, so researchers, uh, people from ministries from all over the region. I, I saw Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Poland. Um, and I don't, yeah, feel free to discuss with us in the chat to ask questions while we're discussing. We will take them up 
Uh, and then we usually also give some people the opportunity if they want to, to raise their virtual hand and then perhaps intervene directly. Now, without further ado, I'm handing over to my colleague Marika van der Weyer, who will give us a little introduction from the OECD perspective on the state of play of VT in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Marike, you have the words. Thank you, Nicola. Let me quickly share my screen. Voila, here we go. Um, so yes, as Nicola was saying, I'll give a quick overview of some of the key data points on uh, work-based learning in Central and Eastern European countries in comparison also to Germany, Switzerland, Austria, which are really the leading countries in the OECD when it comes to work-based learning uh, and, and the dual system, of course. Um, so just as a starter, and I'm already warning you, I have lots, lots of figures in my presentation. Um, so first of all, just to understand, uh, vocational education uh, differs widely in terms of size uh, across European countries. And also, of course, uh, across Eastern and, and Central and Eastern European countries. As you can see in this chart, so here it shows the, the share of vocational students among upper secondary students. And you can see on average across OECD countries, around 40% of upper secondary students are in vocational programs. Um, you can also see that, for example, in Lithuania, this is less than 30%. Whereas in Slovenia and the Czech Republic, this is as high as 70%. So very big differences here between uh, OECD countries and also between the Central and Eastern European countries. Now, there's already one point I want to, to mention about Hungary here, because it will come back later as well. Uh, so the share is quite low, but this also reflects that they only report vocational schools in their data. Whereas they also have a middle track, which I call Technicum since recently, which is not included in the data, although other countries might call it a vocational track as well. So something to keep in mind that for Hungary, the share looks low, but it could be, it's probably a lower, lower bound on the share of, of VET students. Now VET doesn't only differ strongly in terms of size, it also differs hugely in the way it is organized between countries. So there's many differences in what VET looks like. And one of the biggest differences between countries is the use of work-based learning. So the, the time spent by students in the company. So this chart shows you uh, the share of students in those vocational programs at the upper secondary uh, level that are either in school-based programs or in programs that combine school and work-based. So when we say combining school and work-based, that means they have a, a significant part of their time actually in the company. So at least 20% of the time to be classified as such a program. And again, you see very big difference. So across the OECD on average, around a third of VET students are in those combined school and work-based programs. So they have access to some a significant proportion of work-based learning, but very big differences that you see also uh, in terms of Central and Eastern European countries. And then of course you see Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, especially Germany and Switzerland, you see that around 90% of VET students are in those programs that have a strong work-based component. Now, if you look at the Central and Eastern European countries for which we have data, you see, for example, that the Czech Republic and Lithuania, all the VET programs are fully based in school. So they might have a very short work-based uh, component, for example, one or two weeks in a company, but that's it. So there's no significant amount of work-based learning happening in those countries. Likewise, in Estonia, Slovak Republic and Poland, the majority of students are in programs that are in the school. Now, there's a, you see also on the right that Hungary and Latvia are a bit surprising in these data. So if you just look at, at what it looks like on paper, all students are in work-based learning, and that seems like a very good outcome. But if you look at it a bit deeper, you see that there's some, some things that we need to note. For example, um, while this data tells us that all the students are in programs that have access to work-based learning, this doesn't mean that all the students actually go through work-based learning. So for example, in Latvia, work-based learning is optional. So even though students can go to work-based learning, they don't have to. And if you look at the data, well, there's not a lot of data, unfortunately, about this. But if you look at it, uh, at some of the evidence, it still remains a predominantly school-based program in Latvia. Likewise, in Hungary, 
Again, everyone has in principle access to work-based learning in those programs, but um, the evidence shows us that only around 40% of students actually go through work-based learning, mostly because they cannot find a work-based learning opportunity. So even though these data look very good for Hungary and Latvia, in reality, it does look a bit different, which is different in Germany and Switzerland, where in fact, almost all of those students in the dual system actually spend a lot of time in, in the workplace. So lots of differences uh, in the way that this is organized. So even this figure, even although it already gives us a hint of the differences between countries, there's still a lot of differences that are inside the black box, let's say, of work-based learning. So there's differences in terms of the quality, of course, but also in terms of the duration of the work-based component, whether it's mandatory or optional, um, also whether the, the student receives remuneration, for example. So it remains a bit of a black box, but uh, we have done at the OECD a bit of work in trying to, to quantify these differences. And as my slide shows, it is quite complicated. It's a complex system with lots of differences between countries. Um, I've just tried to, to highlight some of the, the important differences here. Um, so for example, you see that countries differ in terms of the length of VET programs. Some are less than a year, others are up to four years. As I mentioned before, some have a mandatory, most actually have a mandatory work-based learning component, but not all of them. As I said before, in Latvia, it's an optional uh, work-based component. Um, and then that obviously means that not everyone goes through the work-based learning. And a very important aspect is the duration of work-based learning. So you see, for example, Switzerland and Austria have 80% of the time of the full program that is spent in the workplace. Whereas in countries like Estonia, this is only around 25%. And that's obviously a very important difference. And finally, in terms of remuneration, in most countries, uh, interns or apprentices are paid, but that's not always the case. So still, it remains a bit of a black box and we need to, to learn more about what it looks like in practice. And there's still a lot of gaps in the data, so we don't know exactly how many students participate in work-based learning. But another angle to look at it is also to look at the firms. So how many firms actually say that they employ vet students? And this is data from a European source. So it only covers European countries. Um, and you can see here the share of uh, firms with at least 10 employees that uh, employ uh, an apprentice or, or another form of work-based learning student. And you can see clearly Germany here with a large share of employers um, actually providing this type of training. Uh, whereas in some of the Eastern and Central European countries, the share is very low. Look at Lithuania, Romania, Poland, Bulgaria, Latvia, for example, where it's less than 10%. What you can also clearly see in this chart is that uh, large firms are much more likely to provide work-based learning than small firms. Uh, that's the case in all of the countries. And if you would, if we would have data for the smallest firms as well, you would probably see that that is even much lower in those firms with less than 10 uh, employees. Now, we all know the benefits, uh, I think, for, for students to participate in work-based learning. So they have access to, um, to, they can develop the right skills on the skills that employers are looking for, both technical, but also those soft employability skills. But of course, there's also many benefits for the employers. And that's very important for them to be willing to take on those students that they know of these benefits. Um, and if you look at, again, those data from uh, European countries, you can see some differences in the extent to which why or, or the reasons why uh, employers are employing vet students. So for example, you see that um, they do so because they want to qualify future employees. So they look forward and they think if we train those workers, if we train those students, we'll have good employees in the future with the right skills. And another reason that you clearly see here is to select the best students and to keep them in the company. And what is interesting here is that uh, the two uh, dual countries, Germany and Austria, for which we have data here, they clearly see those benefits a bit better or, or, or stronger than some of the Eastern and Central European countries. And that's especially the case for the selection of the best vet students. So in Germany and Austria, 
many firms say that they want to train, to select those students, to train those students and keep them in their company so they have the right skills for themselves. And that is less the case in, in Central and Eastern European countries. Um, so just a couple of, of uh, policy pointers to, to end uh, my presentation. So what can we do to strengthen uh, work-based learning, to, take, to make the most of the opportunities presented by work-based learning? But first of all, it's important to involve social partners, not only in the delivery of, of, of VET, but also in the design. And that's also something where Austria, Switzerland, Germany are very strong. So they involve employers, they involve social, um, um, unions in designing new programs, updating existing programs, uh, deciding also on which programs are no longer uh, needed. And that really makes them ha have some ownership over the VET system and make them more uh, easily involved also in the delivery of work-based learning. So that's a very important aspect which not only helps us get more work-based learning, but also helps us make sure that the VET system is aligned with the labor market needs. Secondly, it's finding the right balance between costs and benefits. So in terms of the costs of, of apprenticeships, of course, we have the wages that employers need to pay. We also have the fact that uh, the, those who are training the students, they are not working as they are normally. So there's also cost involved there. But then there's also many benefits, including the fact that those apprenticeship, apprentices are contributing to productive work. And if you look at the evidence from Switzerland, for example, they carry out regularly a cost benefit analysis of apprenticeships. You see that on average, the net benefit is positive and is quite large actually, depending on the sector and the occupation. But it is true that we need to find that right balance in terms of how to set the wages, how to set the duration, uh, how to find the right quality of training as well. Thirdly, to raise the awareness about the benefits, as I just mentioned, that could be an issue in some Central and Eastern European countries, that employers still see an apprenticeship too much as a cost. Fourthly, not all employers actually know how to train apprentices. Not all of the, the trainers in the firms have the skills, have the experience to support a student in developing skills. And if we think about expanding a work-based learning system, we need to be careful with this as well to make sure that, that employers can train their students, that they have the capacity to do so. And lastly, an important point is to be careful, take a careful look at SMEs, because as you saw in one of my previous slides, they are the ones that are providing the least work-based learning because they have many barriers. For example, it can be quite burdensome to provide um, in terms of, of administration, for example, to be involved in work-based learning. At the same time, they might not uh, be able to give the trainers enough sufficient time to spend with the students. Um, they also might not be able to provide all of the, the training that is needed. So they can, for example, only focus on a specific set of skills rather than the full program. Uh, so they need additional support. They could take the form of support for administration, but could also, for example, uh, mean uh, opening the door for collaboration with multiple SMEs so that they can share an apprentice, uh, collaboration with larger employees, employers as well. So really de designing targeted support systems for SMEs. I will stop here, but uh, I uh, encourage you to take a look at our website where we have uh, plenty of, of uh, interesting findings on how to design apprenticeships and also some specific reports on uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marika, for these insights. And I have to say, before I start uh, moderating the discussion, it occurred to me while you were speaking that I had a very long introduction, but it wasn't long enough because I forgot some important things, one being that this uh, event is a joint event of a joint uh, part of a joint series that we have with uh, IAB in Nuremberg, which is the uh, Institute for Labor, uh, no, Employment Studies, basically the research arm of the German Employment Agency. And I also wanted to, uh, Lutz Bellmann is here, my colleague who's uh, representing the institution. Um, but I also wanted, uh, it's important to me to thank not only the German Association of uh, Chambers of Commerce, but also the, the foreign chambers in Slovakia and Poland, uh, who I think they are all also here because they helped us uh, find and put together 
uh, our panelists today. And that's also true for Vika Uso, the, the Austrian equivalent. They interacted with us and we discussed who, who should we talk to. Uh, so, so thank you. And now let's dive into the realities of vocational education in, in, in the region. And perhaps I would ask, uh, start with Andrei Hutta. So Andrei, you, you represent the Slovak Board of uh, Employers, which is basically entrusted with uh, well, putting uh, the dual system in place. I think you've rolled it out on a large scale, on a national scale since 2015. How did that go? What's your role? What, what, uh, what are your reactions to Marika's, uh, to what Marika said and, and how is it going, dual education in Slovakia right now? Thank you very much. Uh, I think we in Slovakia uh, have a very similar problem that all the Central and Eastern European countries have with the dual education. We are searching the way how to implement the system that would be suitable for us, for our conditions, our legislation, and our, uh, let's say, business environment. So in 2015, we managed to get the uh, novelization of law about the vocational education and training, and we implemented uh, the elements of the dual education there. Before, we was, of course, uh, trying to to investigate the system in Germany, in Austria, in Switzerland. And was, we were finding uh, the, the elements which would be suitable for us. One important notice, in Slovakia, the student in dual education is still a student, has a status of the student, is not an employee, which is the main difference to German speaking countries. Uh, of course, we are uh, leading debates that we would like to uh, get there uh, that the students uh, would be the future employees or the employees during the study, but it is a long way before us. And we are pretty happy that we are getting closer and closer with every step. Just now we have uh, another novelization of the law. So we hopefully get into the legislation, the competence center, competence centers, uh, schools linked to the factories and companies and many, many new exciting things, which we consider that are very important for our environment. Excellent. And um, can you, uh, from your perspective, is it, uh, can you say, can you um, confirm what Marike said that the most important part is to involve the smaller employers? Is that something that you see in, uh, in the Slovak uh, case as well? Well, that's true. Uh, of course, the leaders in dual education in Slovakia are the, the biggest companies or the largest companies like Volkswagen, Jaguar Land Rover, Kia, a lot of automotive companies. Uh, but uh, we have still the problems with the small ones or medium and small ones. Uh, we introduced the various subventions and tax reliefs to help them to enter the system. So we hope this will work. Let's see. All right. So I just sent a, a, an SOS to the audience. I wanted to send it to my colleague to ask where Marianne Lovas of Brose is. <laughs> but I'm um, so do we have a, a swarm intelligence. Uh, Zigova said he's coming, he's trying to connect, so let's hope he comes. Meanwhile, we can uh, turn to Poland and ask Marcin Budzewski. So how, how is it playing out in, in Poland? I hear that you've also made uh, big strides to implement more workplace-based uh, training. How is that going? And what are the institutions you're using to do that? Oh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this um, meeting. Uh, well, the situation in Poland, uh, Let's say it's uh, quite similar uh, to uh, to a situation in Slovakia. So Andrei uh, uh, said <coughs> uh, many things. Uh, I sh I I'm going to uh, to say you, but one uh, one uh, important information uh, um, to describing the situation in Poland is that that we are we have the permanent reform of the uh, uh, school system uh, because. Uh, mm, First of all, we should, we should, we should uh, say that uh, we don't have a separate separate uh, regulation uh, for vocational training. We have a, a regulation for the whole 
the whole system. And the vocational system is a part of, um, of it. That's the uh, first, first um, point. Second, that, um, uh, when we are talking about the uh, dual education, we should think about two systems in Poland, the craft system. Uh, it's a typical dual, uh, dual education system. And the school system is uh, not exactly the same uh, like in uh, G Germany, for example. So, uh, but uh, uh, we should concentrate probably on the, on the, the uh, um, uh, school system. So, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, we had a ref reform of, of the system in Poland. So, we changed the, um, the structure of, of uh, the school system. Now we have um, uh, the primary school, eight years, and next uh, step is uh, for general education, a five, uh, four year school, or vocational education uh, path you know the uh, basic uh, basic vocational education school uh, three years or technical education technicum so this uh, five years uh, uh, school and uh, in this uh, system uh, we have uh, of course a uh, big role of uh, of um, uh, employers and uh, the companies uh, the, the reform and uh, and uh, the regulations uh, said that uh, uh, schools and uh, employers companies should work together to organize uh, a better uh, better internships for uh, for students uh, to prepare together the programs for vocational training but of course, the, the details is uh, the most important as usual uh, thing. So, uh, so Andre said that uh, we have a important lot of big companies, especially especially in a, in the automotive business. Uh, it's easier for for them, it's easy for them to create uh, special classes and uh, to the pa pa patronate for the classes and for the schools and. And after the course, uh, employ um, employ um, students for the uh, SMEs. It's a very very uh, uh, complicated to be in this system. It's uh, a lot of uh, barrier, um, not from the regula uh, regulator, but not from the regulations, but uh, from the barrier from as a SMEs uh, has in a, in a business. And they are too small uh, to um, to have a partner for the one class. They need to cooperate. It's uh, not so easy to uh, to break the barrier and uh, create a, a cooperation between many SMEs uh, uh, and organize, for example, one class for uh, for for such a group. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. And I hear that Marianne Lovas has joined us. Uh, so and Marina, what I would like to ask you, so connecting to this, it's more difficult for small companies. When we had a chat before uh, this meeting, you told me that, well, it's a lot of um, work. It has to be established because the system wasn't dual in the past to have this communication of you being the workplace trainer and the school, the trainers, uh, the teachers in schools, they have a tradition of doing the uh, practical training in schools. Now you're coming and saying, I'm doing it in the company. So uh, it takes some time. Maybe you can tell, uh, tell us about this experience from your perspective as a workplace trainer who's been pioneering the dual education in Slovenia. Hello, everybody. Yes. Can you can you switch on the camera? Is that possible? We can hear you well, Marianne. Uh, is it possible? Of course. Yeah. So you can do it yourself. On my yes. Part. So we would like to see you, if possible. <laughs> uh, I did it. Okay. Good. Okay. okay camera. All right. You're connecting. And uh, if you want to, while uh, it's now, well, we, uh, well, I can't see, maybe it's coming. But uh, maybe you can just uh, start to talk and then we hope we can, it will turn on. Okay, at yeah? the start, uh, because uh, we are browser, 
So uh, we have a lot of experience, many years experience in a, our dual education headquarter is in a Coburg. So uh, for Prievidza, it was uh, easy to start uh, to set up the dual education system here in Slovakia in uh, our region. Because we use knowledge from Germany, support with AHK and also support our partner schools. But uh, uh, my reaction uh, to your question is that, yes, a uh, lot of time uh, takes communication with schools because, you know, company is uh, uh, in Prievidza, schools is uh, 10 kilometers from company and the teachers, what I see, uh, uh, what is important to say, teachers don't have so much time to, to uh, uh, develop a dual education system because our technical partner school has uh, most of the classes uh, in a standard system. So dual education system, dual education classes has, uh, for example, our school, uh, schools has uh, maybe two classes. So they, they need also many times to develop and uh, cooperate with companies. Okay, well, thank you, Marianne. That's that's very um, interesting or good to hear. Uh, Tomek, you you run a uh, Tomas Maskiewicz, You run a, um, a a very I think technologically advanced uh, school close to Poznan. You cooperate with Volkswagen, with Mitsubishi, and others. Uh, maybe you can tell us from the school's perspective a little bit, and I don't know, I don't think you're not, and you're not a traditional schools-based school, I think, in, in, in Poland, you were really implemented to, for dual education, if I'm not wrong, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it would be great to just explain what the school is like, who you work with, and then perhaps how do you see this um, work to establish the cooperation between the schools and the companies and perhaps also how it works with the smaller companies if you do work with them uh, yes hello um, my uh, research and development center which i match uh, helps the education system by violation education uh, we are working with the schools but also that what uh, Nicola say, uh, says uh, with uh, companies, small companies and big companies. Um, I think I want uh, I want to say uh, a little bit what Marcin Budzewski says uh, about stabilization. And that's the most important thing uh, in Poland and I think in other countries from uh, East Europe to stabilize uh, the population, uh, population education because uh, each year or each four year when we have um, uh, elections, we change it, or uh, uh, eight years. And when I have worked in uh, VV, I was responsible for about two years for uh, vocation education. And I know a little bit of German, uh, German um, vocation education. And there is uh, stability from many, many years. I think, Nicola, you can uh, say yes that for that. Uh, you don't change it. You wait for the uh, results and you see of if that uh, works correctly in Poland, uh, the stability um, is not so good. We we, we change it uh, very oft, uh, very oft. Uh, and when you say, ask me about how we uh, uh, help the these schools, uh, we have a lot of equipment because in Poland is a big um, problem because in the uh, uh, beginning of the 19th uh, in Poland was uh, idea the population education is only for the young people which don't want to learn without ambitions. And that was many years. Uh, I think uh, the uh, access to European Union and open the uh, um, work market show us that the vocation education and uh, uh, that kind of uh, way of your uh, career can also bring benefits and can also uh, um, give you fun. And from that time, I see that uh, it, it, it's changed. It's changed in direction uh, which I think is good because we invest a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, in uh, vocation education for the infrastructure. Uh, uh, we buy uh, new technologies 
we uh, try to implement them uh, in the uh, school programs because the market uh, want that from us, from us, from the school, uh, from uh, such a research center like mine, uh, want that we um, will be teaching young people that what they see in the uh, companies. They don't want from us uh, uh, education only uh, in the paper or that was uh, also was uh, showing on the Marika that uh, on the presentation that they uh, uh, they uh, learn only in the school because after three years, it doesn't matter of three, four, five years, it depends on the country. Uh, we should have uh, employees which are which have skills, uh, but employees are not, are not skills uh, which have unemployees. Uh, that is the most important thing because then we know we have uh, two, three, four years uh, passed and uh, we don't have effects of the uh, of the uh, learning. When you ask also me about uh, small companies, uh, that was for me uh, important is to uh, uh, to work together because in Poland it's like this. Not every company is so rich and have so lots of money like uh, VW. Uh, to uh, uh, to work with young people because it's one thing is responsibility and think there are costs we we should say about it uh, uh, and the benefits are in the future um, and not all of the companies small companies uh, can afford it uh, and for me uh, or my experience says the companies should uh, hang together and uh, they uh, then the cost are um, for more participants uh, um, the, 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 the more participants take the cost because uh, when I see on the vocation education we have similar um, skills uh, automation uh, on uh, robot programs uh, we use robotics in uh, fast all of uh, um, companies which are producing something that means small firms should uh, hang together and then uh, it will be for them uh, for sure easier uh, to go in the vocation education. Great, thanks a lot, Tomek. And I think before I turn to Tobias Bola, I would go like to go back to Marika and uh, inquire. Of course, this is an issue everywhere, right? That it's more difficult for small com uh, companies to implement uh, vocational education. They may not have all the elements that they need to provide the um, uh, the practical training according to curriculum they may not have the tools and also of course all the overhead looking for um, uh, for apprentices um, investing the money um, so you talked about working together forming consortia groups um, i know there are examples from some countries i think group training at uh, institutions from Australia does it, uh, Austria, maybe you can tell us a little bit about sort of best practice examples from OECD countries that perhaps countries from this re region could look at a little bit. Yes, I think the one you mentioned from Australia is a, bit, uh, is a kind of famous example where indeed there's a consortium or a group training organizations that are set up and they employ the, the apprentices and then send them to different country, uh, to different companies. So they coordinate between the companies. They also support with the administration. They help uh, the apprentices navigate. So they really are there to help both the firms and the apprentices to really make it work that, that the SMEs work together. Because as a few of the, the panelists were saying, Indeed, we all know that they should work together, but it's also quite difficult for them, quite costly, time consuming, and so it can create even more barriers instead of, of solving them. Um, then, of course, SMEs can also work with larger firms, so the, and, and then larger firms can be the coordinators. There are many different forms that this can take. On the regulation side, it can be complicated as well. I, for example, in my own country in Belgium, where we were discussing this as well, they just introduced a new dual system uh, and they also wanted SMEs to be involved. But uh, on a regulation side, an apprentice had to work for one company. So this also would, in some countries, can require some, some changes to the regulation to allow that, uh, that, that uh, apprentices do part in this firm, another part in another firm. Um, so there are some barriers, but uh, there's certainly examples that can be looked at where it works uh, quite well. 
Excellent. Thanks, Marika. And before I even turn to Tobias, I have a first question from the audience, which I will take. It's from uh, Jens Hoy, a colleague who covers uh, a number of uh, Eastern European countries as a, as a desk uh, economist in, um, in Paris. Uh, so, Sabine, can you unmute Jens? I think you can Thank talk you very now. Much, Nicola. Uh, I find it very interesting this discussion between big and uh, small firms. However, my the question I always ask myself: uh, Are the small firms any good at providing quality education? Uh, when we look across the Eastern European countries, there's a tendency for small firms to be not using the most modern technologies. Tend to be relatively low in the we call it supply chain and that's kind of a vote of and at the same time the schools uh, tend to a lot of schools don't a lot of countries don't invest enough in their vocational training schools so what you see is that the schools use relatively old machines although the machines are not as old as the teachers so getting a modern education in the schools is difficult the small firms, they're not really on the tra trajectory to uh, use modern technology. So that means that uh, big firms often, particularly the German firms that establish themselves in Eastern Europe, they establish their own school to ensure that the training of their workers is of a sufficiently high level. So one thing is to talk about how it should be organized between small and big between work-based and school-based. But I think that an equally interesting question is how to ensure the quality of vocational training is up to support continued economic growth. Thanks, Jens. Yes, and, and I think that's the perfect uh, uh, teaser for Tobias to come in. He's uh, Tobias, you uh, run basically the, you coordinate the international outreach, if you will, of, uh, of the German Association of Chambers of Commerce in everywhere in the, in the world to implement work-based, um, workplace-based training in those countries. Um, Jens just mentioned that there are some big German companies that establish their own schools. I think that's true for Audi and um, in, in Hungary, for example, but there are other examples. So how do you do it? And how do you see your work as, um, as uh, the Association of German Chambers of Commerce when you come to other countries? And I think you have a very strong presence in, in Central and Eastern Europe and implement those systems. What do you do? How do you ensure quality? How do you work with the partners uh, on the ground? Thank you, Nicola. Uh, good morning. Warm regards here from Berlin, from the DIHK. Uh, indeed, uh, the question is pretty customized and tailored to, uh, to us because uh, from Berlin, we support around 50 countries at the moment. So we have over 100 offices, chambers abroad in the world. You could uh, just underline that 50% are doing vocational training. And uh, I want to mention two things. There are certain standards and regulations, like um, our colleague from Brose uh, said before, the IHKs by law are responsible for vocational training in Germany. So we are closely working with them together. Um, standards like in company training, trainer and also examination are actually really aligned to the German way. Yeah? So, um, it doesn't matter if it's big companies participating in our programs or small, they undergo certain examinations and it's for everyone the same. The central role in each country is actually the AHK, the Chamber Abroad. I think we have here our colleagues from Warsaw, from Poland. They are doing vocational training since 15 years. They have a, have a big team, a team which is capable to train people and to also, uh, let's say, um, acquire new companies. The same for Slovakia, Hungary. I want to mention Serbia and also the, the Balkan region, North Macedonia. So wherever you have a AHAKA, you would have a good infrastructure. And um, I want to come back to Marika, what she said, someone has to put this stuff together and be the platform 
to check the curricula, check the demands. This is most likely uh, the AHACA, which actually um, implements so-called vocational training boards. And in this board, you have the companies in the driver's seat for the demand. You have the vocational training schools and you have the public sector, like people from the ministry. All should be together on one table. That's how we know it from Germany and discuss about uh, the, um, the setup of the system. So. Uh, so to say, this is a little bit our secret um, where we can align standards, but we are always flexible enough to react on national uh, requirements. Our saying here in Berlin is we are not there to bring the German dual system one to one to other countries. That is not working. We have different uh, layers of uh, standardization, a layer one to one like German dual training, a layer more customized and a layer which might be interesting for the audience. It is a strong uh, development in further education. So uh, beside long term three or four years training, what we mentioned before, are the people staying in the company, do they pass the exam? It's a long way to have actually some role models. Maybe you should also look into your countries, into further training, into training center. So that's just a basic statement from, from our side. And the school is important and the employee both have to go together. It's not good if the, the company is really high level and the school have no good tools and no teachers. So the RK are also training the teachers and it's really important that both are on the same eye level. And I think wherever we have a RK in place, they're doing a great job. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think uh, the so the foreign chamber, German foreign chamber in Poland, I think some colleagues are here too, and there I know that they don't necessarily, so they do work with local schools. So they put together the companies and uh, Tomasz raised his hand and Martin raised his hand. So uh, Tomasz, you go first. And then... thank, you. thank you very much. Now I want to, uh, I want only to uh, agree to, uh, once again with now with Tobias that uh, Polish German Chamber helps supports, and that is uh, important, is to take the support what they give. Uh, we shouldn't afraid because uh, the schools or the uh, small companies, uh, they uh, they work full time job. They don't have a lot of free time to see. Ah, maybe now I go in the vocation education uh, and um, AHK or or, or um, uh, Polish German Chambers with their experience. And when they also with the people uh, help that and support it, and um, I think uh, they do a great job. I know them from both sides. One side was when I was an employee in uh, VW, and now when I'm uh, uh, managing um, research and development center, and I think they can help both sides of them to uh, uh, the same purpose to to take a, a school hand and. Uh, um, small companies or big companies hand and go in a good and one direction that is important thing and that i wanted to say and many thanks for my colleagues in uh, polish german chamber yeah perfect and i think so I have two more from the panel we are already interacting well martin wanted to say something to this also and then mm -hmm. I thank you very much <clears throat> i'd like to add uh, one point uh, to the polish regulation <clears throat> because in general we have a very flexible regulation uh, uh, in terms of uh, vocational training. It's okay, and that's the first uh, first uh, um, thing. That second, that <clears throat> during our uh, project, especially uh, the project uh, uh, with uh, one of uh, um, uh, employer or organization Leviathan. Uh, we have prepared a model a curriculum uh, for um, some occupations uh, into uh, sectors. Uh, the <clears throat> one, one remark this all uh, depends to the cooperation uh, uh, between uh, the school manager and the manager of, of uh, the company, even small uh, or big. There's a <clears throat> not a question of uh, the regulation, it's a question of a uh, cooperation and very often personal relations between those uh, those uh, people and uh, mm, here on the lo local level that's uh, mm, very important uh, let's say to not to regulate too much not to influence to the, these relations but just help 
to uh, to uh, to establish relations and and uh, make it uh, uh, growing. And uh, one more one more uh, very important thing when we discuss about uh, dual ed education. Uh, we should uh, always uh, remember that the school or the center of uh, of education, uh, vocational education, or or, or uh, continuing education, never be uh, uh, equipped as company is. So uh, the relation uh, and uh, inter internships uh, in the in the company is very important to be updated for for students and for for the teachers as well perfect thank you thank you martin one question i have and i will ask that to andre will uh, intervene after you but one question i have something i've seen so i've covered many eastern european countries also on this matter and uh, one um, i think one issue that came up of course and one reason why it works well in the german speaking world is that they do have the system of chambers who basically run um, they run the exams, they, uh, they define the curricula, etc. So basically, and then firms are actually in Germany, it's compulsory to be a member. So in some ways you contribute automatically. We talked about where well, firms have to understand that it's an investment that's worthwhile making. So um, can this be uh, one of the challenges uh, to roll it out in, in, in Poland and other Eastern European countries that you basically do not have this structure. You said before it works well in crafts and crafts, I think you do have this structure. So is it something you kind of need uh, and perhaps, uh, yeah, that, that, that would be interesting to hear from your perspective. Martin, do you want to take that question? The problem with, uh, <coughs> Uh, okay. uh, the voice. Because, you, you didn't hear me? No. Uh, now I'm hearing. Could you please uh, uh, repeat the question? Because yeah, the question was: uh, in many in Poland, you do not ne necessarily have this chamber system that they have in Germany, Austria, etc. Mm -hmm. And of course, that helps a lot to implement this because they organize the curricula, they negotiate, they. They, they negotiate the curriculum, decide on them with uh, social partners. They do the uh, the exams. So is that that one challenge uh, for, for, it, for rolling it out, also to taking small companies on board? That this doesn't exist in the same way in in Poland. It is a it's a challenge because as I said before that uh, this, uh, in, in Poland uh, we have general problem with. Uh, Cooperation or uh, um, establishing groups uh, uh, of companies uh, working together. This is a, this is a, it's a challenge. <clears throat> of course, we have um, uh, some uh, in the uh, uh, school regulation. We have uh, 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 some some uh, some kind of some some bodies uh, which. Uh, uh, sh um, which should help to create, for example, curricula. On the uh, local uh, level, uh, the bodies uh, <clears throat> uh, should the, the, the companies should join such such uh, such bodies and and helps uh, school managers to work on it. But you know, this is some. As I, I said uh, that I want to say uh, uh, once again, it really depends to the to the uh, uh, cooperation uh, between the managers, school managers, and the, and the companies. Mm. Okay. There's some, this is the case. Perfect, the personal relation. So Andre, yeah, I've, I've kept you waiting for a long time, but, but it will also be, so you say whatever you want to say, but it would also be interesting to hear because you did put in place in Slovakia, this board of employers. And of course that was for a reason, right? What, what role do you play there? How important do you think it is to have such a board? And also what role do you play in terms of making sure the, the training in the company has the quality, uh, yeah, uh, complies with quality standards. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to say thank you to, to Tobias because uh, I would like to say here and use the floor that our Slovak uh, German industry, uh, DSIHK, 
the Slovakish industry handles camera is doing a great job in Slovakia, according to dual education and promoting it. So I'm greeting to, to our Slovak German colleagues. Secondly, when I'm listening to uh, our Polish colleagues, we basically have the same structural pro uh, problems in Poland and Slovakia. And I think in Hungary and Czech Republic will be the, the same. I would like to encourage to, to get closer and use the Erasmus Plus programs to exchange the knowledge because we are searching the ways in every our country, we are searching the ways how to implement the dual education suitable for our system. So let's, uh, let's sit together virtually or not or in person and let's uh, let's exchange it it might be really helpful and to answer your question this board of uh, employers is very very uh, important in one way we facilitate because the system is new and of course uh, there is a lot of interests uh, in this system and um, we are meeting regularly and we are uh, having our members from every stage of uh, slovak uh, economy and we are discussing what are the needs and where we, we can find, uh, let's say, the best solution suitable for everyone. Because, to be honest, you cannot uh, satisfy everyone, but you have to find a way how to moderate it and make the system working for the most of the companies in the system. And, of course, for the students to benefit from it. So, our, as, as I see, our main role is to communicate with the ministry, with our partners with our members, with companies, and search the way how to make the system suitable for Slovak Republic. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And good that, uh, yeah, to bring up Thomas, I'm coming to you after this, but I wanted to ask one question from the audience to Marian Novas, because he's from a company and can perhaps answer. So there's Matthias Bohm who's asking, well, in these German speaking countries, there is this tradition also of companies to invest in their apprentices, right? And they see it, not all of them, uh, the, the, uh, it's going down also, uh, <laughs> the number of companies who are taking on apprentices, but the ones who do, they see it as a profitable investment. That's how they see it. It's, it's costly for the company. So, and uh, that's something we hear a lot in, um, in countries that don't have this tradition, that it's difficult to convince companies of this fact that it's actually profitable. So how do you see this from well, your perspective? Of, uh, of course, Marianne is the German perspective because you belong to a German group, uh, but perhaps you have contact with suppliers, et cetera. So, would you say, what, what would need to be done to, to roll this out more generally in, in Slovakia and perhaps raise this awareness that taking on an apprentice, uh, a, a trainee can be profitable for companies who, who invest there? So you ask uh, if it's profitable for the company? It was uh, the end of the question. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, it, whether it's pro no to raise awareness to show companies that it is profitable, so that more will take it up. You you take it up because you have this German tradition, but well, perhaps you can tell us. Maybe you think it's not profitable, <laughs> but you can tell us what your perspective is and what what you think would be have to be done to convince more companies in Slovakia in the region of the benefits of this kind of training. So this trading is definitely a benefit for the uh, new generation, for the apprentices, of course, and uh, also for the company. Uh, you spoke uh, that uh, in German companies it is a standard. So now we have the standard in uh, Prievidza in Slovakia. And uh, we combine uh, or use uh, the knowledge from Germany and combine the knowledge of vocational education training uh, which we have and, uh, and had in Slovakia. So uh, this is our way. Uh, what is important to say that uh, first uh, graduates, we will have this, uh, uh, this school year. So we are quite new. Uh, like uh, we start, we have started uh, by with the uh, law from the 2015 in Slovakia with the dual education system. So the first graduate we will have uh, this year, and uh, 
uh, we're still developing. This first year uh, we roll out and uh, for the next years uh, we will develop the quality of uh, dual education. So uh, I, I, I don't know what, uh, what, uh, what may to say more. No, that's perfect. That also means that in, in, in some ways you don't have the experience uh, uh, yet uh, to say, well, this is why it's profitable for us because you've just uh, taken it up basically. But the hope is probably that you will have very qualified. Um, yeah, uh, of course, of course. That fit your yeah. needs, right? Right. Yes, perfect. of course, of course. Thank you. And, and, and would you say, because you said your master, you basically a trainer there and a qualified trainer with pedagogical training. Um, but of course, you do have a certain size as a company. Um, do you think it's feasible to do this for smaller companies? And, and do you think it's feasible to join forces, something we discussed before, either with bigger companies or smaller companies amongst each other? Um... I think it's, it's, it can be used also. It, it doesn't matter if the company is uh, uh, higher or big or small, it, it doesn't matter. Of course, uh, the smaller company has uh, some specification, but uh, uh, for example, in uh, this region, in uh, uh, Prievidza, uh, there are two companies, not only Broze. And uh, uh, we are happy that uh, uh, we are not alone because everything what we are doing, uh, some decis decisions, also everything what we're preparing, some materials, and uh, when we're preparing for the examination, and all of what is a standard for this dual education system, we are uh, doing uh, in a, like a partner. So all partners, I can say, is not only schools, AHK, but also all the companies. Uh, so I think it's, it's possible to use in every company. The most important is if the company uh, is, uh, want to invest and in, uh, uh, work with young generation, with uh, next generation next generation of all employees. Thanks a lot. Uh, Tomek, you had a point here. Uh, do you want to, uh, to intervene? Uh, uh, yes, also that uh, the question was, was very good. Uh, and uh, my experience is, or in my opinion, uh, that what helps uh, to rise uh, dual education is also best practice, showing the best practice. Uh, but uh, in similar uh, regions or uh, similar companies. Uh, when I was working in VW, uh, I have heard a lot of oh, VW, they have money, they can do that. And when someone compares uh, VW uh, with uh, small companies, um, it doesn't uh, go right. We should find uh, best practice uh, by the companies or the regions uh, or the countries which are similar, not only uh, when, get, uh, when, when we spoke about fi financial side, also culture. There are lots of things which uh, we should take uh, when we uh, compare uh, to show uh, that works or that uh, don't work. The second thing was, uh, which I want to tell also, um, it's in, in, in Poland, I don't know how it's in other countries, we shouldn't forget about local government. In Poland, local government is responsible also for the schools. It means uh, there are three uh, partners in uh, dual education. One is the school, for my now for my side is important uh, the companies and the local government which is a, 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 a part which uh, coordinate a work of schools and when the companies uh, and the school and local government speak the same language i think uh, it works and uh, uh, i have many maybe not many many but many uh, uh, best practice in poland where the local government uh, support the companies and the school to to go in the direction uh, which uh, I think we uh, all agreed we want to have educated young people which are for the labor market uh, good employees. 
Great, thanks a lot, Tomek. And I would like to uh, unmute, so I mean, if you can help Kurt Schmidt from EBB, which is basically the, uh, the Vocational Education Research Institute from Austria. And you had a point about the role of chambers and perhaps another point. So um, you have the word. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Nicola. Uh, I would like, just like to mention um, one topic uh, which came up before uh, about the role of chambers and that uh, in many countries uh, of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, there isn't a chamber system similar or comparable to the German speaking chamber systems. Um, that's true, not, not always true. For example, in Serbia, very much uh, developed a, a chamber system similar to Austria or the German system. But uh, even if you have a chamber system, I think it's very important uh, to raise the issue or the topic. You have to build up capacity in the chambers for dual vet. That's one thing that chambers promote dual vet or, or just um, um, bring in the topic uh, that dual vet or that the full time school based vet system should go more in a work based uh, learning system uh, approach. But the other thing is what would be their role? It's one thing to uh, to advocate it, but the other thing is to really become a, comp uh, a, a competent stakeholder in the process, because it's, it's essentially as, a, for example, Tobias mentioned, well, we have to have the employer side on board in designing, in governing, and uh, in a way in administering uh, dual vet with other stakeholders too. So I think that's also a topic uh, one should keep uh, or one should have in mind. Great, thank you, Kurt, for this intervention. We have Marike who wanted to make a point as well. Yes, just coming back to the, the benefits, how to convince or, or how to show these benefits. Um, mm -hmm. Where I think one of the challenges is as well, was raised already before, is the reputation of that in some countries is still quite low. And of course, in that case, employers will also not see the benefits of, of getting on board in such a system. Uh, but, and that's also mentioned by Kurt, what can be helpful here is to get employers on board in all the phases all of that to ensure that it corresponds to what they're looking for, that the quality that they're looking for, that they can contribute to that. So that's also a way for employers to, to see more of the benefits of that, to make it so that they know that students who are coming to their firms, who they will be training, will actually be the ones that they can uh, they can employ in the future. So that's important. On the chambers, just to add that it is indeed something that many countries are looking at. Uh, I just recently saw also in, in England, for example, they just published a new strategy for skills where they look very much at the German system of chambers to set up something similar. They have structures in place, but they want to reform them. And they're also looking at Germany. So there's many countries that are taking that example. But it's true that it's not, you not only need to set up such a structure, you also need to give them the capacity to, to be involved in all these different stages. Totally, thank you. Maybe, uh, uh, Tobias, you, you can add something here about, uh, because of course, you, well, you're doing it mostly, well, you're not doing it only for German companies who invest in, in, in other countries, you do it for locals also. So what do you do? Do you have a strategy to make it clearer to the companies you want to get on board, what the benefits are for them? Yes, uh, thank you that I can underline. I think we are here in the core of uh, core of discussion. Also, if it comes to, to the companies, uh, most likely I just posted the, the map where you can also follow up which countries have a functional AHK and dual training. You see the occupational profiles and you will also get guided to the website also in local language, so further information. So uh, normally uh, we have to be honest, uh, the German companies like Brose or in Macedonia, Drexelmeyer, Marquardt, they are in the driving driver seat. When I myself, I, I joined the AHK in North Macedonia as an expert two and a half years, and uh, Drexelmeyer already had own training approach, also with the local government. So our approach was not as a chamber to say we have now uh, here a new project and we want to help you. We, we had to give a benefit and uh, Drexelmeyer, to be quite frank, could do it on their own. But when we acquired more companies like Coaster, like, uh, like uh, 
um, also Macedonian companies, Drexelmeyer got actually interested. And here we come to a crucial point. They, they come interested in the image creation. We did marketing, we went to the public schools. So especially for small countries, I mean, North Macedonia is really small and one day you can drive around and uh, meet all the CEOs of the companies, but you give a benefit as the chamber in bringing the platform together. And at the end, um, uh, what I said before with the vocational training committee, uh, the government needs to be aligned and they have uh, have to need a good, um, let's say, um, um, some benefits out of it. And my, my strong advice is from the first point you're running a project, involve either the uh, education ministry or whatever the institution in the country is, involve them active. Also, if you offer trainings, they need to be, they need to be involved and then they see a benefit and they can actually grow their structure. Yeah? Um, one sentence here, uh, as a Sir, Sir uh, Weiter commented, this is a role of AHK. Whenever good things happen, for example, the first training batch is done. Uh, you, you can do marketing about it. You go in the media with it because we all stakeholders together, we have to create a better image for the vocational training in Central Eastern Europe sometimes still ah oh yeah the guys who don't make it uh, to university but it's not true especially the companies who take them over will most likely what i know pay good salaries and give them a good uh, good uh, development some of them might even go to university so um, that's my point. We involve strongly also international companies, Swiss, Austrian, wherever they come from. Uh, we are not exclusive for German. And most likely the best is if you involve national companies, because then you can go to the economy minister and he will say, thank you. You're also supporting our economy and it must be vice versa. And you will have really good effects. And I guess the chambers, at, at least in North Macedonia, Serbia, Poland and Slovakia are already showing that. A last sentence, if I still have uh, 20 seconds, for the in-company training, for example, what I'm aware of that in Slovakia, if you enter the in-company training, um, the certification from AHK, you are already aligned to the national standard. So um, it's really recommendable. You don't have to go do two exams. You have the AK training and there were, I think, good talks to, to the government that they say no double certification. If you enter the German standard, you already have the in-company training standard because as you all know, it's not a miracle. It's clear structure, the methodology, how to be a trainer, safety, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's everywhere the same. So that can be also a good uh, development in the countries if AHK is talking to the government and you have recognized um, uh, certificates. That would be great. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this intervention. And with uh, one intervention from the chat, I would like to turn to Andre uh, Huta again. There's uh, Daniela Lalohova. She pointed to a structure that you have, you have in Slovak, and I'm sure you're aware of it. Uh, so the Slovak Alliance for Modern Business, where Billa, DM, Tesco, Lidl, Kaufland, they, they work together. And, and you all already said, oh, we need, you know, Erasmus Plus exchange across borders. This is more, in a way, uh, an exchange among different foreign investors. And my question to you would be, or a cooperation, um, how much do you see, can you, is this something where you can really benefit, so Slovak companies can benefit from not technology transfer, but basically capacity transfer in some ways. So looking at uh, examples from different countries and taking on what works, but also of course doing it their way. Is that something where you would say foreign investment can also be beneficial? And to which extent can smaller Slovak companies perhaps work, cooperate with big, well, bigger Slovak companies, but perhaps also bigger, bigger foreign investors? Is, is that something where you see opportunities? Yes, uh, thank you. First, uh, greetings to, uh, to Ms. Laluhova. Uh, they are as well uh, members of the Republic Union of uh, Employers which are a member of our board as well. So they are incorporated in the board indirectly through this organization, one of the three largest in Slovakia. Secondly, uh, your question, of course, the main tool 
uh, we see that can be uh, useful in this uh, point to get the, the, the big ones and small ones together is the competence centrum or competence center as we call it. Uh, knock, knock. We hope it will be in this legislation of uh, vocational and education uh, training act which is now going through parliament in Slovakia. So, so we hope it will be there. And when we have it, we have this useful tool how we can put a lot of small companies together with the big ones, with the, with the federations and uh, create an environment which will be financially and uh, technically sustainable to provide not only the floor for them to meet and to, to, to exchange, but to provide the technology for the uh, insufficient technology for the small companies which don't have it to to um, to create the environment which will provide the quality that is what we we are expecting from it sounds great sounds great uh, thomas i would like to go back to you with the basically with the remark that jens made some time ago where he said well you know maybe for small companies it's better to have this school-based uh, learning where the practical learning also happens in the in the school would you subscribe to that i mean you're very well equipped or could it be a combination of having practical training in school and then whatever the small company can do in the company or would you say there's really a, a benefit that shouldn't be missed in terms of having the practical training in the company? I think for the companies is the biggest benefit that they have the young people in their companies to teach them uh, not only the uh, technical skills, but also the culture of the company. Uh, it is important that uh, in Poland, for example, first year of the uh, vocational education, they uh, stay in school, and then the second two years they are working. Uh, uh, they are the working uh, uh, or uh, education uh, educated in uh, companies and in school. Uh, my experience, or in my, or, but also in my opinion, uh, this uh, second two years are very important. The young people can uh, uh, connect. They can feel the the company. That was, uh, I was many times in German and I see, for example, 26, 28 years young people which told me I have 12 years experience in Audi Neckelsloom. And I asked him how it possible uh, they, they go uh, children to work? No, with the whole of the uh, vocation education system, they are connected, they are working, we can say working uh, at the company for many years. For example, in Poland, when I asked 25 or 28 years uh, old uh, men or, or women, they told you, I have maybe two, three years or five years. It's, it, it's not, it, 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 seem, it seems to be, or it's, it's a smaller experience with the companies and that is big benefit. And the second thing is the labor market um, give us uh, the answer, uh, how big is the benefit? Because we don't have employees. And, uh, and when there are employees, they are very expensive. We must pay a lot of the money for the experts on the free market. And maybe the answer, not maybe, is the answer to rise, to create, to educate uh, young people which have the skills on, and know the culture of the company after three, five, six years. And after that, when we give them opportunity to study, we have uh, uh, employees which are uh, 25, 26 year, years old with 10 years experience with uh, work in the factory and they are skills, uh, study skills. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, perfect, uh, a perfect thing. I think that uh, when we speak about it loud, uh, the companies understand it. They can with um, not so uh, big cost for buying a, a, a expert employee in a free market. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Martin has a point there. Yes, I'd like to, uh, to say um, <clears throat> in relation to the, uh, Thomas uh, and uh, Tobias, uh, what they, what they uh, said, the changing of uh, image of vocational uh, education is very important. And uh, uh, we are making some, some progress in Poland because uh, and now we have a uh, more than 55 percent of uh, of uh, students on uh, in in the vocational on the vocational path 
So this uh, this important we should we should uh, show it. We should uh, show good practice at Tobias said that uh, there's a a language of of benefits. So uh, what what is the benefit for for students? What some benefits for for companies uh, from the uh, cooperation uh, uh, between the schools and 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 uh, and uh, uh, companies? And what is the benefits from the vocational training and uh, a good occupation? Of course, the the, the important uh, indicators on the labor market uh, uh, show that. Uh, People uh, with a vocational uh, background, with vocational education background, they uh, uh, say they're better position on the uh, on the labor market, uh, better salaries, and uh, people uh, with a good occupation and vocational uh, background. So there's a smaller uh, group of uh, unemployed. Unemployed people. There's a, a good point. It should be it should be uh, sh uh, shown. But we are discussing. Uh, I think we are talking about the let's say normal normal uh, uh, times, normal uh, uh, normal situation. Uh, now we are uh, in different world. I think it's a very uh, complicated for uh, for vocational training and education to teach people teach students uh you know uh you know online that's uh, i think that's a g very big challenge uh, for uh, everybody not in uh, not only in poland i think Absolutely, and that's uh, also a question that came very legitimately from the audience, from Ivan Stojanovic, who asked, so what's your experience in COVID times? How are you doing it? And um, I'm going to ask first Marianne uh, whether it had, you know, whether you somehow had to re reduce presence in the company and for how that played out then for your apprenticeship systems that were very new. How, how, how is it working? Uh, practical workplace-based training in COVID times. That would be interesting to hear, I think, for the audience. In the first wave of uh, Corona crisis, uh, we have uh, three months uh, when uh, we have uh, completely closed or dual center. So it was uh, the best time to uh, update all presentation and and finish with all the uh, all materials which we didn't have finished. So uh, this was a big challenge for the masters and also for some trainers in Brose. And uh, uh, what we used, uh, I want to say thank you. In Slovakia, we have a software uh, with the name EduPage. This is a software which used every teacher, every school, uh, also primary, secondary school. And this software also using uh, some companies, we using. Uh, this is software for evidence uh, of uh, development of the students and uh, study plans and so on. And we, uh, we use it, we start using, using it at uh, 100%. So, uh, this brings uh, corona crisis and uh, so we have to move to to uh, digital digital path and after that we uh, restart and uh, now we have a very good situation uh, that uh, uh, because it's uh, uh, it's uh, about uh, company situation uh, when I speak with uh, Corona, and uh, so the apprentice is in a company, full time, like a standard. Only what we have to change. Sorry, are you hearing me? We can hear you. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry, because I, I for for a while lost uh, the. Uh, so we. Uh, we only we have to make some changes because we have uh, at 100 percent uh, areas uh, only two areas uh, where we can provide practical training 
So uh, we uh, only have to have uh, in the same time two groups of, uh, of apprentices. So we make a time of organization and uh, we go a standard way currently. Perfect. Th thanks for these insights. And Tomek, uh, of course, with the youth school, you must have insights there too. How, how is it playing out with the crisis, with the lockdowns? Can you operate as usual? I know you're working with companies who do drones and you have artificial intelligence. So maybe going digital is no problem for you, but it would be interesting to hear. Mm, I know uh, our meeting is recording, but I uh, try to be honest. <laughs> it's not so good, like you say, when we have uh, new technologies. Uh, in my opinion, um, the main problem, but not only, is that we don't, uh, that is a failure to adapt the curriculum to the um, new pandemic conditions. Um, for us was March 2020. There was two or three months where was the pandemic in uh, in year which was already in the education. But after that we have a uh, summer break and we didn't uh, change the current program to online or to hybrid. We leave it uh, as it was. And we expect that a pandemic, uh, the COVID goes. He don't go. And now uh, we have the same program. Everything is the same, like without pandemic, without COVID. Uh, and that is a very, um, a very bad, very bad situation, I think, in other countries also. And I think uh, we should uh, so quickly as, as possible to fit the education programs to new uh, circumstances, uh, to new situation in which we are. Because one thing is uh, in infrastructure. We can say uh, not everybody have laptops, not everybody had AI, what I want, uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, the, the, the important thing is the education program uh, was built when the, uh, when the children are in the school and they are not in the school. And nobody uh, wants to take it and uh, change it. I know it's difficult. I know uh, it uh, needs time, but we don't have this time. Uh, each day, each month, each week, each month, uh, the children don't go to school. And then they will have a, a large um, education, uh, I don't know how it's English, uh, education um, zero there for the for this because online education in the uh, and technical education is difficult to learn uh, how you can learn online on the machine which is standing in the company or in the school uh, okay we can uh, virtual imaging make making what you want but it's not the same and after one or two years we receive these employers young people which are after one year without uh, touching the machines and we want to give them machines. It's a, it's a bigger problem for me. The, it's, it's very bad that we don't change the education programs to the uh, new situation that we are all. But my uh, answer about the, the experience, which I was asking from, uh, uh, from the chat. Perfect. And I think, yeah, it's very, and I saw Andre was, was nodding. We have very little time left, but I want to, uh, well, I want to just pick up one question um, because um, from the audience uh, and give it to you, Thomas, and then to, to Andre, or perhaps first to Andre, because you just talked. Um, the question was, how, is there any demand from local firms for this dual training? And I think it's it's from uh, Mr. Konina from Hungary. I think it's good. It's also to others from, so you could uh, answer this in the chat, I guess, uh, because it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's demand in Slovakia since you rolled it out, but it would be interesting to hear whether there's a difference between foreign fir firms and the local firms. And if you want to pick up anything on COVID, of course, also. First on COVID, uh, I, I agree. I agree with our Polish colleagues. The situation here is as well terrible. As you know, we have a very bad situation according to pandemics. And it's a pity that uh, kids are not one and a half year in schools, especially in vocational education and training, uh, where they need to get in contact with machines, with companies, etc. Secondly, the I don't see a huge difference between foreign companies and Slovak owned companies uh, in the interest of having dual education. I think the interest is the same. Where is maybe the, the difference is the interest of students. 
because of course when you when you should be the dual student for Volkswagen or I don't know Brose or US Steel big companies it's more attractive than to be a student for a small slower company so we have to work I think it's the same problem with with our Polish colleagues we have to work on improve on improving the image of dual education with the young people and to promote it, promote it as the way to get the right education. So for the Atomic, I, I would just like your insight there too, because you do work with foreign companies, but you do also work with Polish companies, no? So there seems to be some demand from Polish employers, or how would you describe that? Yes, we are working also with the Polish companies, but that's what Andre uh, was already told is uh, easier uh, uh, to um, um, to take young people and to tell them uh, you will have a, a, a vocation education with uh, VV or with Gestamp or with Bloom or with I don't know uh, Mercedes or uh, Ford then a small uh, Polish company but then we go to the uh, was already on the chat uh, sales salary um, I think um, we can all agree, we can say about uh, education development, where you want to be in 10 years, but today the young people ask uh, uh, about salary. And that is okay, uh, and that is correct, and uh, that what uh, important is when you don't have on, on your back uh, a VV logo or, uh, or other big companies, you must try to take them with a salary and a possible to grow up with the company or development them, and that 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 are the reasons or that are the benefits which we can uh, which I always say to the small companies look he will be grow with you he will be uh, honest with you and he uh, uh, work also for your success because he know uh, the success is also uh, him if, uh, the, the success will be uh, also for him in big companies you are uh, one of the uh, 10,000 or 20,000 or half a million in small companies you can you you, you feel uh, you have you, you are um, Mm, the, 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 the success or the uh, mm, or other things are, are, are near you. And I think that is also a benefit which uh, a small and Polish firms give uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the young people. But it's uh, difficult to compare with, uh, uh, with the uh, marketing or PR for uh, VV or Ford or uh, biggest companies in, in the world, because we are speaking about such a companies. Well, thank you, Tomek. I think that's a good final <laughs> conclusion. I want to thank you, everyone. Uh, so, Marianne, Andre, Tobias, Marcin, uh, Marike, and Tomek. It was, a, and also the audience, which contributed a lot. I think it was a very so. I I've, I've learned a lot. I've enjoyed it. I think it's great to cross notes from different countries and different.